Hey everybody, today Rado rounds up the month of January 2020, and it was a good month to start out a new year, a new decade in fact, and I am full of hope and optimism that 2020 is going to be a year where we finally start turning things around. Fingers crossed. But that's a topic for another day, because today I'm just going to tell you about the 22, I think, yeah, the 22 new games and expansions that my wife and I played over the last four weeks. And as always, I'm going to count them down for you, starting with our least favorite, ending with our mostest favorite. And I don't really think I need to go into much rigmarole. Let's just jump right into it, starting with number 22, The World Without End. And this is a game that has been around for a long time. I think it's like 12 years old. It's definitely missed its 10-year anniversary edition window, sadly. And that is sad, because this is actually a really sharp game. The sequel to Pillars of the Earth from the same designer, Michael Renick, although I think he had a co-designer on this one. And um, I've been trying to get this covered for a long time, because for the longest time, the folks who follow request.rado.com, which is where you can thumb games games that you want to see me cover, they have real, I mean, I, this game had hundreds of thumbs. People have wanted to see it for so long. So, thanks very much. Huge shout out to the good people at Off the Charts Games in Gresham, Oregon, and Mike Vanderveen of Print and Play Games in Vancouver. These folks got together to get me a store copy of World Without End so that Jen and I could play it. And, yeah. It's a good game. It's got some very cool ideas. But as was often the case 10, 11, 12 years ago, the two-player scaling is non-existent. I have rarely seen a game that so badly demands two-player scaling rules, which is too bad because, again, uh, if this game came out today, if Michael Renick were to revisit this for a 10th anniversary edition, oh man, this could get knocked out of the park. There's two cool ideas here that I like a lot. Putting aside the brilliant presentation, uh, you know, and the really sharp overall good, you know, Euro goods conversion to victory points mechanisms, there's two really central things. One is every round, the lead player is going to place a diamond shaped card with one point of the diamond. Uh, pointing in each of the two, three, or four players, and that determines on the point of that diamond what everybody gets as free income, plus the player who's controlling it. Also, there's an extra pointer on that card that gives them a little bonus. And that's really cool. We found that to be a compelling decision all the way through because this is what I want so bad. But that means I have to lay out the diamond such that you're going to get something even better. Um, so maybe I should rotate this way, but then I won't get a bonus and stuff like that. That was really sharp. And I knew about this. I'd heard about it. That was a really cool mechanism. Here's the deal. That's not what really makes World Without End special. Nobody talks about the card play. Um, everybody has, a, I think it was 12 cards. And on your turn, after that little income phase with the diamond card, shaped cards are done, Everybody plays two cards, one face up and one face down. The face up card is the main action they're going to do this round. The face down card is a card that they've had to give up. And so every turn, uh, uh, you are slowly working your way through half of your deck of actions that you will deny yourself, that you just will not get a chance to do. And of course, all of these actions are good actions to do. So that is a constantly um, fun and interesting decision to make because you're, oh, you know, I, there's no way I'm going to need this particular card. I'll just put it face down. I'm going to dump it. I don't care. And then a few rounds later, you find, why did I get rid of that card? Because of the way the game has evolved. I so desperately need that action right now. Now, you know, this game came out a long time ago, and we have seen uh, similar ideas to this, like uh, most recently in Paladins of the West Kingdom, which made a lot of people's top tens last year. When I covered Paladins of the West Kingdom, I had no idea how much its core central mechanism of choosing your paladin owes thanks to World Without End. And World Without End, I can definitely say, having played it now, it is a great game at higher player counts. But the complete and total lack of two-player scaling, uh, it, it really kind of falters in a big, big way because there's just so much resources. There's no tension, no threat, no drama because there was no scaling done for two players. So I would love to play it again as a four-player game, but as a two-player game, it needs some work. Fingers crossed, somewhere down the road, maybe it will get revisited because the core ideas in World Without End really surprised me how good they were. But okay. Now, let's move on to number 21, The Captain is Dead Lockdown. <clears throat> now, a few years ago, back when we were still in Malta, I did a run-through of The Captain is Dead and revealed that both Jen and I liked it a lot. A very sharp, pandemic-inspired 
um, you know, disaster mitigation adventure cooperative game, but with a very strong Star Trek flair. I mean, it's thinly veiled Star Trek. I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, the first officer getting their beard is an event that can happen. That's a very powerful move in the original uh, Captain is Dead. So obviously, it's clearly uh, you know a game that is in love with its subject matter, which is Star Trek. And so, uh, Lockdown is the sequel, and. At its heart, it's largely the same game. It is still about each player taking on a member of a crew, and the game comes with, I think, like, was it 16 different unique playable characters with tons of variability? And our characters are still running around on a uh, spaceship, but in the first game, we were on the equivalent of the Enterprise, and we were trying to keep the Enterprise safe, uh, enemies were beaming in, uh, systems were breaking down that we had to repair, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. The second one, Lockdown, our crew has been captured, and the captain is still dead. And so now we're on an alien ship trying to break out of Lockdown. And you still do the main stuff. I mean, you, you get a certain number of actions every turn, you move around, you are using skill cards. It is 80, 85% the same game. But there's a couple of core changes. One, in The Original Captain is Dead, you start out with all the systems online. The sensors and the transporters and you know uh, the security measures and all that. <clears throat> and it's really a tough decision. Right, we've got all these different tools to use to solve all the disasters that are going on. In Lockdown, you are locked out of all of the alien equivalents of the transporters and whatnot. And you have to spend a fair bit of time sneaking around trying to turn all those things on board. And it's not until you have those systems online that the game really starts to pop and you start getting a lot more interesting options about how to proceed. And so, while I appreciate that, it's a very strong thematic setting that we're put in. It is nowhere near as fun. It feels like it feels like you took Captain is Dead, but took away all our toys! And so we don't have any of the toys at the beginning, and we have to slowly re-earn our toys. And so, that was one thing. And then the other thing is, because this is an alien ship, there's a lot of minutia that you have to keep track of for aliens that move around independent, and we have to stay away from them, and all of that. And while, again, these were all cool ideas, it was just a bit overwrought. And, um, you know, and the game ends up taking, like, twice as long as Captain is Dead ever did. And, a good deal of that time, there's just not much you can do. We're really kind of powerless, trying to earn our power. And I found myself playing Lockdown. I, I really enjoyed the setting, and the story that was being told, but I really miss the gameplay from the original Captain is Dead. So Lockdown has a lot of really great ideas in it, but it just did not live up to the level of its predecessor. That's number 21, Captain is Dead, Lockdown. Then we have number 20, Parks. And this turned out to be a super popular game last year. Made a lot of people's top tens. And I totally understand why. It's gorgeous. The whole thing is based on art that was commissioned by the uh, National uh, Parks Association. And hey, the, all this, all this, uh, you know, this great, these great posters for all the American parks. Let's turn them into a game, and that's really cool. And then the game itself is all about. Um, it's a what do you call it? Not a time track game. It's kind of similar. On your turn, you've got a couple of hikers, and you're going to pick one of them to move forward as far as you want along a trail, and wherever they go, you get to do that action. And this is a game of collecting goods to be able to convert them into points through various and sundry mechanisms. But the thing is, if somebody else is already on that space, oh, you can't go there until they move away. So, it is, I guess, really a worker placement game. You do have ways you can go to occupied spots, or you can just wait, because you have two hikers, and you can say, okay, well, I'll just have this other guy go until you eventually get off the spot I really want. So, there's good, solid gameplay. Wonderful beautiful presentation. And so there's a lot to like here. Why is it at my number 20 of the month? Because, well, just like a World Without End, the two-player scaling is practically non-existent. And uh, Jen and I found that well, actually, interesting. We played this as a four-player game, and the game gets tense, and it, there's a lot of wrangling. And okay, can I afford to wait? Will you move out of the way? Because you might not move for a while, and will I be able to get what I need to go? Should I spend these extra resources? Should I give up on this and pursue that? In a four-player game, there's a lot of fun decisions to make every turn because the trail that everybody's uh, traipsing along gets very crowded. In a two-player game, it does not. And the game just becomes really relaxed and laid back, no real significant challenges, nothing really gets in your way, and we were, Jen and I, since we're predominantly, predominantly two-player gamers, we were pretty disappointed. 
And I don't understand why. This game so could have been scaled. Really, all it needed was some very simple rules to introduce dummy hikers that would move in semi-predictable ways and block spaces the way that uh, human opponents would. I mean, because the reality is, I, I, I can make pretty accurate assessments about what you're going to do, because I can see what it is you need. There's not really any secrets in this game, so can I wait or should I go now? Burn the hand two in the bush stuff? That so easily could have been replicated with some very, very simple dummy player movement rules. Just go and look at... um. Oh, Dungeon Pets, as a great example for how the two-player scaling of Parks could have been put in, and if it had, this would have been in my top 10 of the month. Maybe my top 5. Because, again, the presentation is sharp, the gameplay is great, but only at the higher player counts, and we were really disappointed by the two-player total lack of attention that Parks gets. And so, that's that one. Then we move on to number 19, Legendary Forest, which is a lovely, another beautiful, uh, verdant, rich, lush game. This is is a bingo-esque tile layer where every round one player uh, reveals a tile from their own personal supply and says, oh, it's tile number 19. Tells that everybody gets a matching tile and then everybody is building up their own little legendary forest. And, um, as is often the case with these sort of bingoist tile, um, you know, even though we might start out doing the same stuff, pretty soon we all branch off and lay our tiles in very different ways to try to score points. And, it is a very good game, but my problem with it, and Jen's problem with it is, it is a very lightweight, gateway-style game. Here's the thing. We actually played it, Jen and I, with Jen's mother, who was visiting uh, you know, this month, and we had a great time playing it with her. Uh, because, you know, she's still a very much a board game novice. She's very hesitant about playing games with us at all because she thinks they'll be too, um, you know, top-heavy and they'll just be frustrating for her. She was able to enjoy this game immensely, and we enjoyed playing it with her. Simple, light, tile-laying, even lighter than Carcassonne, if you can imagine such a thing, but still some interesting decisions. And um, now that Emily has gone back home, I don't think Jan and I have much use for it because it is too lightweight for us. Feather Featherweight, great gateway game, lovely, easy to teach, one, a great game to play with kids or, you know, parents or basically just non-gamer geeks. I think you'll find really good use for Legendary Force. But as an ongoing game for me and Jen, as hardcore game geeks, too lightweight. Okay, then we move on to number 18, Fox in the Forest Duet. Now, I think this game is going to get a lot of attention with good reason. This is a two-player only trick-taking game that is cooperative. And that is an odd duck. That is definitely a strange combination of features. And I should say, this is actually the sequel to Fox in the Forest, a game which, I'm, sadly, I have not played. I'd really like to give Fox in the Forest a try, because I hear nothing but great things about how wonderful this two-player-only trick-taking game is. But the original Fox in the Forest is competitive. This one is cooperative. And the whole thing centers around players trying to um, win or lose tricks. Uh, because you and I are doing trick-taking with all the normal stuff, you know, following and trumps and, uh, you know, and, and all of the normal trick-taking rules. And uh, if I'm the one who wins a particular trick, this little marker in a little forest is going to move towards me a certain number of steps. Whereas if you win, it's going to move towards you a certain number of steps. The number of steps is based on little movement things that are on the uh, cards we're playing tricks with. Or we're winning tricks with. And... <clears throat> The tricky thing is, we are playing cooperative, and I have no idea what's in your hand. You have no idea what's in my hand. When you play a card, you have no idea if I'm going to be able to follow suit or if I don't have any of that. And, um, of course, a lot of these cards have special powers on them as well, so when you play them, they let you, let you do things like swap cards and, and, and do various and sundry things. And it is a sharp game. Um, Jen and I enjoyed it. We played it, I think, three times. Twice on medium and once on hard. And really, our only problem with it is maybe we play too many of these imperfect communication games. Cooperative games where you're not allowed to strategize with your teammate. You just have to kind of trust that they will intuit what it is you're doing when you do a certain thing and they will respond accordingly. You know, Jen and I, we played a lot of games like this and we found Fox in the Forest Duet, even played at hard level, was not particularly challenging. Now, and which is weird, because I've seen a lot of other reviewers say that it's incredibly hard and they were really challenged by it. And um, again, I can only uh, chalk that up to the fact that chances are, because we have played so many of these... I mean, heck, my wife and I, we've been married for decades now. We can complete each other's sentences. We can intuit what each of us is going to do. And uh, like I said, 
we found while the game is sweet and charming and interesting, it was also just a little bit, you know, the strategies were pretty apparent to us for how to succeed, and we succeeded pretty rarely. That said, though, I am kind of lying, because here's the deal. There's another element to this game, which is memory. A big part of this game is playing cards that have special powers that will allow me to have some limited knowledge of what's in your hand, because we did a swap, or because I can see you take a card from some place, or whatever it might be. And... It is crucial to success for me to remember what you've got, what little information I have about your hand. And not only because I put a card there, but also through, wow, um, you know, uh, you know, because of circumstances, you know, I, I know you don't, yeah, I know you can't follow suit, but you didn't do this other thing. You must have wanted me to win this trick. Therefore, I can intuit what it is you're probably wanting on the next round. You know, there's stuff like that. But a big part of this game is remembering what you have seen. And Jen and I did not care for that at all, so we cheated. Uh, whenever I would hand her a card or we'd do a swap or whatever, we wouldn't put them back in our hands like we're supposed to. We'd put them on the table face up. And also another thing, once cards are played, once their tricks are gone, they're supposed to go out of the game face down. So you're not supposed to be able to count cards and write, right, well, how many more threes are there? Because you're supposed to remember. And Jen and I hate memory. And so we were cheating a little bit. And I imagine the game would have gotten harder for us if we did not leave cards that we temporarily knew what they were if we didn't keep them face up so we didn't have to remember. If we uh, didn't discard cards face down, uh, face up but face down so we couldn't count cards, I imagine the game would have gotten a lot more challenging. And here's the deal. We then wouldn't have enjoyed it at all because we hate memory in games. So we basically played a variant uh, to, you know, memory-free version so that we could uh, analyze probabilities, remember what each other had, and, you know, based on special powers and stuff like that. And under those circumstances, the game was too easy for us. Which is too bad because, again, charming, wonderful presentation, a great fairy tale aesthetic to it. And our only way that we could probably have enjoyed it more would have been to hate it more because we hate memory and games. So we were really, you know, we were on the fence. We wanted to love it. A great little game, fast, super tiny package. I still look forward to trying regular Fox in the Forest someday. And if you don't mind memory, and you don't mind imperfect communication cooperative, and you like wonderful, gorgeous presentations and fast gameplay, you might want to check out Fox in the Forest. But that's why it didn't really work for us. Fox in the Forest duet, I should say. Okay, then we go on to number 17. The Captain is Dead, Dangerous Planet. Yes, folks, The Captain is Dead again. This is the third game, cooperative game, to come out in the Captain is Dead series. And again, you have access in this cooperative game to a huge array. Again, I think it's 16 unique characters, all of who have radically different powers, and we are going to work together to try to deal with a, a, a never, a seemingly never-ending series of calamities using cool Star Trek settings and powers and technology and all the rest of it. This game's a bit different. We're we're not on the bridge anymore. We're not being held captive in an alien gulag. This time we were on an away mission. And the shuttle has uh, settled down and it's under assault. This game is basically a... Uh a tower defense style game because there's all these lanes that bug alien bugs are just coming and swarming and coming faster and faster and over the course of the game they get faster and faster and more and more as we try to set up our lines of defense and collect all the alien artifacts we've come here to get and get out before our shuttle gets destroyed. We liked it. Not quite as much as the original Captain is Dead, but um, this game kind of harkens back to what we loved about Captain is Dead because, again, it gives us all those toys right from the get-go. So many uh, cool... I mean, a lot of them. Actually, if anything, this kind of feels like Star Trek meets James Cameron's Aliens. Because a lot of the game is about setting up literal machine gun nests that will automatically fight off hordes. And while, okay, we, we can leave this, this, this lane is defended for now, and let's go on ahead and travel over here, because this is where we need to be searching and exploring to find the stuff we are. Oh no, the machine gun's overrun, it's been destroyed, what are we going to do? Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of an interesting mix of sci-fi genres, and I actually really liked that a lot, and Jen liked it too. Uh, so there's a lot to like here. Lots of variability with all the cool player powers and the uh, the uh, the technologies we get access to uh, because now we're getting access to alien techs. When we find these alien artifacts, they give us special powers. You never know exactly what you're going to get from game to game. And not for nothing, but it was a joy setting the board up and actually creating these lanes that um, you know, which are made up of individual tiles that the bugs will be streaming out of. It, it felt kind of a nice creative activity. I, mean, I kind of felt a sense of pride once I'd made the board that we were then going to have to fight on and defend. Why didn't it rate higher? One real reason. Um, and this has always kind of been the case with all the Captain is Dead games. 
uh, they, they go to very high player counts, either five or six players. I don't remember exactly what. But usually when a game goes to such high player counts, generally speaking, the majority of the playtesting and the balancing and the tweaking and the fun factor is going to be found at those higher player counts. And it's a rare game that works as well at two players as it does at five or six players. And that really, that's the only problem with uh, Dangerous Planet. The Dangerous Planet is huge. And as we were playing, we really felt like we should be playing with four characters here. Just two, me and Jen. Well, first of all, a lot of the special powers for a lot of characters really assume you're going to have more than two players running around. And they become pretty weak if there's only one other player on the board because they have to do with players standing in the same spot. Sure, if there's four or five people running around, chances are there's going to be other uh, you know, people next to you that you can use those powers. At a two-player game, there's so much ground to cover, we're spread too thin. You, and so a lot of powers are gone. And, you know, just a lot of the opportunity for, uh, you know, okay, I'll handle this thing while you handle that thing. With only two players, we kind of got to handle everything. And it worked. We definitely enjoyed it and had fun. But the whole time we were thinking, boy, this would be a lot more fun if there were two more people running around in this gigantic underground alien maze trying to hold off, uh, you know, these crazy nonstop bugs. So we liked it. But again, it's a game that I would have liked to see a bit more scaling work done for the two-player experience. The two-player experience is okay. And I suspect the higher player count is great. And so playing it makes us, well, we can't play it like that. So that's why it comes in uh, Captain is Dead, Dangerous Planet, at number 17. Higher player counts, mm, I bet you this would be a lot of fun. Okay, moving right along then to number 16, Florenza, the dice game, which is the latest roll and write, and it is definitely one of the richer, heavier ones. Not the richest and heaviest, but it's certainly top three or four. I mean, it's up there with Rome and Roll and Fleet the Dice Game, and this game, which is a continuation of the Florenza game series. First we had Florenza, the board game, and then the card game, now we have the dice game. All of these are... Games where players are Renaissance-era patrons of the arts trying to gather the resources and hire the artists to make famous works of art or famous works of architecture to bring glory to our family. You know, standard stuff. Um, and the I, I, of all three of the games, this one is certainly the fastest and in some ways the most compelling. Um, but we did have a couple of problems with it. It's a really good roll and write game. But in twitching to roll and write, all of the interesting thematic trappings that were in the earlier Forenza games pretty much get stripped away. This is one step removed from abstract. And that's okay, but having played the earlier Forenza games, I wish a little bit more work had been done to actually bring the simulation, that what we were actually simulating in the game, to life and make it a little bit less of a, uh, you know, a spreadsheet exercise of, okay, I got these resources, I'll trade them in to do this other thing. I don't know what the thing is, because I can't read Renaissance-era Italian. Um, so... But still, that's a minor complaint, because the gameplay was still good. Our bigger issue was, it's player scaling again. Uh, it works well as a two-player game, but here's the thing. If you're the active player, there are six dice that give us access to stuff. And uh, uh, the active player rolls all of them and picks three of those dice for themselves, and then the other players all get access to the other three dice. And um, in a two-player game, that means 50% of the game, whenever it's my turn, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get three dice. I'm going to have a huge amount of choice. I'm going to have a huge amount of control. And then when it's not my turn, on your turn, I only get to pick one. If I were playing this as a four-player game, 75% of the time, I would only get one die. And often, I wouldn't get the die I need because you took it because you were the active player. In a two-player game... It's only 50% of the time I face that problem. And because of that, Jen and I felt like, wow, there's not much tension here. And this happened in um, Florenza the Card Game as well. I feel like in a two-player game, we're going to get done what we want to get done before the game timer is up. And I really would have liked to see something done. You know, I mean, really, all they need to do is, hey, after my turn is over, before it's your turn, let's, uh, because the game actually comes with very good solo rules, let's bring that solo character in and have them go. So we're a uh, two-player game is emulating a three-player game, and then I think this would have rocketed up quite a few more steps, because that would have largely addressed the player scaling. Then I would have been a bit bothered that it was still a little bit more dry, a bit more abstract than I would like, because the theme has literally been sucked out. Um... But those two things combined is what keeps uh, what well, otherwise might have been a top 10 game, Florenza the Dice Game, out of my top 10. It's number 16. Then we move on to number 15, Tricarian. Now, here's the deal. I did a run-through of Tricarian. It was on Kickstarter half a decade ago, um, back in 2015. 
And at the time, I was super duper impressed by its really clever, fresh take on worker placement. And it had a lot of really neat ideas. It had a wonderful presentation. But I definitely had issues with some of the things as well. And I had mentioned them in my final thoughts. And the game eventually came out a year later. And a lot of the stuff that I had complained about got directly addressed because the game was still going through development when I covered the prototype. So ever since then, for years now, people have been, on my request geek list, people have been saying, I want to see Tracarian talk about Tracarian now that they have addressed the issues that Jen and I had. So this month, Jen and I finally, five years later, revisited Tracarian and um, got to see the final version. And I've got to say, it really does feel like the developers just ticked every box that I complained about. Um, you know, concerns about the boards being too big, uh, in large part because the cards that you know lay, lay off the boards. Okay, now the cards are on the boards. The boards have been redesigned, so it doesn't take up quite so much. It's still a table hog, but not as bad as it used to be. That was a complaint I had. And um, oh, the uh, overwrought overwhelming amount of decisions because of the special power cards and the prototype I had, you could just switch them in and out all the time, and it created so much AP. Those are handled in a much sharper way now. That just works so much better and really keeps the game humming along much quicker. Really like that a lot, the way those power cards are handled now. And... Probably the most important thing is, a big part of this game, where we are Victorian-era magicians putting on shows on kind of like a weekly schedule. Um, in the game, multiple players can book space on stage for the same performance on the same night. And if I'm doing a, uh, a particular type of trick and you're doing a different type of trick, we can both put our trick markers on the playbill for that night. And if we can arrange them, we can get bonuses. And I complained that while that's a really cool idea, it just didn't appear in my original prototype because... With only one other player, why am I going to bend over backwards to try? I mean, because it's it's the, you know it's a zero sum. We both get a bonus, or nobody gets a bonus, and it was a real shame. That's been addressed too, because now the play there are special two player only play bills that have a neutral player, so I can link with them and try to get the bonus while still arranging them so that you can't get a bonus based on the tricks you have. So these are all improvements. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And so then, why does Tricarian sit at number 15? Uh, especially since it is loved, so beloved by so many people. Well, I gotta say, Jen and I played it, we enjoyed it. There was another issue we had with it that is still definitely the case. This is a long game. A long, long, long Euro. De definitely, even as a two-player game for us, over two hours long. And I didn't really see much in the way um, to make it a more satisfying short experience. This game is all about sitting here for a long, epic game. Um, and... I don't know, maybe Jen and I, well, maybe, we are. I was going to say, we are getting older. Five years ago, maybe I had more patience for super long games. These days, two plus hour games, it's a rare one that really captures our heart. And so for us, Tracarian felt a little bit on the long side. I imagine with repeated play, we'd get it down to where we could get it into, you know, maybe sub 90 minutes. But... The game is still a little bit on the long side for us. And also, while I appreciate the neutral player to really enhance the linking gameplay of tricks on the same night, I do think that's it's 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 a good step. I actually went back recently, uh, because we after we played it, we were like, well, ugh. I wonder what this feels like at a higher player count. I went and watched a full playthrough that the Heavy Cardboard Channel did, Edward and Co. And I actually sat down watching, like, yeah. Look what's happening in this game. Um, because the worker placement is so much more compelling at a higher player count. The linking on the playbells is so much more integrated into the decision making at a higher player count. It, I can definitely say Tracarian is a good Euro. It's a good, solid, heavy, heavy Euro for two players that takes a long time. And if that's what you're looking for, if you don't mind really long time and really heavy gameplay and really thematic and gorgeous presentation, it's still going to work. But... I think you'll still be thinking, boy, I wish we had a third player here. Because that would be more fun to link with a third player than with the neutral player. Uh, because there'd be more decision making going in. So, definitely, Tracarian, I think, lives up to how much I was impressed by it five years ago. But I 
my tastes have kind of changed a little bit over the years, which is why it doesn't rate quite as high. I had actually also intended, uh, it now has really strong solo rules with an Automa player. I had wanted to try to get that to the table too, but I realized, oh my gosh, this is so long. I don't know I have time. I don't know I have time. But folks, uh, there are lots of videos for Tarkarian, including playthroughs showing off how the uh, solo player works. It was in Dalgar's Academy. So, um... Yeah, I think the game it has a long prosperous future. I mean, it's it's in it's one of the uh, highest ranked games on Board Game Geek with good reason. Just not for me and Jen. Number fifteen, Tricurian. Then we move on to number fourteen, Dungeon Alliance Adventures. This is another revisit to a game I covered a few years ago that was on Kickstarter, and uh, Dungeon Alliance is interesting. It is a deck building game. It is a fantasy dungeon crawl game. And unlike most games of this style, I do not control one character, I control four. Uh, each player sitting at the table controls an alliance of four heroes. And uh, the deck you are building to control these heroes is going to be, over the course of the game, full of more and more cards of increasing power that not all your heroes can use. So, in a given turn, you might really want your, um, you know, your dwarven assassin to rush over there and backstab, but... I don't have any cards in my hands, um, except for that, that work with my dwarf, because he's the only dwarf on my team, and everybody else is elves. So I've been deck building with elves up till elvish cards, and I haven't put enough dwarven cards in the game. The decision making that goes into deck building, because of the um, the racial and the professional makeup of your team, uh, is so interesting and so compelling. I was impressed by it all those years ago. I continue to be really impressed by it because. On the one hand, you want to really specialize. You know, have all humans or all dwarves or whatever, so that you run into fewer problems of, you know, having a hand of cards that won't work with your characters. But that means every turn you have the opportunity to buy a new card and add it to your deck as you kill monsters in your experience that you spend to add cards. Um, what if you really specialize in elves and there's no elf cards to buy? Then you're boned. So that um, switch back and forth between wanting variety but wanting a uh, homogeneity, uh, uh, homogeny, homogeneousness um, is great, and it still works great, and it still holds up, and I'm very, very impressed by it. Now, the reason I'm talking about Dungeon Alliance today, though, is because uh, just this month they came out with four new expansions called the Adventure Expansions. Uh, each one of them has actually two uh, little mini campaigns that you can play through multiple games, and they come with new creatures, new cards, but most importantly, big old stacks of narrative adventure quest cards. And here... I was so excited to try these out because the original Dungeon Alliance I played was very, very cool, but it was all about just scoring the most points. Even if you played cooperatively, you were just playing to try and score points. <clears throat> One of the things that got added was quest cards, and they really mixed the game up and, and you know, uh, added an extra flair. So it's not just about points, it's about you know sacrificing things so that I can complete these quests because they can do other things for me. The quests were fantastic. Uh, the only problem with the quests that came in Dungeon Alliance is, if I recall correctly, the game came with 12 of them. So that's good, but you're going to run through them pretty quick. These new adventures come with big old thick stacks of new adventure cards um, that are very, very cool because they tell contiguous narratives, but in a non-linear fashion. And that is very interesting to me. I haven't seen anything else like that. I have seen, you know, ever since Pandemic... Legacy Season 1, the big old thick deck of narrative cards, and you oh, I can't wait to do the event that pulls the next thing, and we can see what the next thing in the story is. Here, you've got that stack of cards, but you're not necessarily going to go through it in order. You might skip the top five cards and go right to card 12. Or, or you might have a thing that says, hey, draw cards tw 12, 13, and 14, and pick one of them. The other two are out. 14 is the one you've done. If you want to really see what kind of impact 12 and 13 had, you got to start a new campaign. So even though, um, you know, you, you get, um, again, each game comes with each of these three expansions, or there are four, no, there's four different adventures, and each come with two, but they have so much replayability because as you go through the campaign, you're not going to see all these events. The other thing that's really cool about how they're implemented that I absolutely adore is, um, you know, there's the big old stack of narratives, you know, numbered one through whatever, and you'll see a certain number of them, but there are other uh, events that are the narrative kickoffs. Those cards get shuffled into the main library deck. And so slowly over time, in the flop of cards that is usually full of, oh, special powers and items and whatnot that I can buy and with my experience and put in my deck so I can become more powerful, scattered randomly amongst those are little things that said, oh, hey, you know what? The princess got captured. 
or whatever it might be. Are you going to deal with that? Actually, I don't think I, I did not see a princess captured. That's a quest from the original. But you know, uh, you know, when these cards comes out, you're like, oh, I can buy one card. I'd like to get this weapon. But if I get that, then I get to go into the narrative thing, and that's when I get to look at cards 12, 13, 14 and make a choice. But that's the only card I can buy. So am I going to forego making my deck stronger so I can have these narrative moments? And that's an interesting level of tension and uh, excitement also. Whether you play competitively or cooperatively or solo. So I am very impressed by how these adventures are implemented. And honestly... I think other developers should take a long, hard look. Because these days, as more and more campaign play is being dribbled into more and more games, both Ameritrash and Euro-style games. I mean, I made such a big deal last year about how um, you know Americaibo did it so well. But everybody's following the pandemic formula of, oh no, the story's going to play out in the same order. You're going to see the same cards. People pay attention to Dungeon Alliance Adventures because they show you a different way to do it. And for my money, it's a better way because it's more responsive to player input. Things happen not because it was preordained, but because of choices I make. And it means, hey, I finished the campaign. I didn't even see half of the stuff in there. We're going to roll our uh, do and start all over. I'm very impressed by that. So, highly... Well, first of all, if you like Dungeon Alliance, you must get these adventures. If you like fantasy deck builders with lots of crunchy stuff, if you're a Mage Knight fan, you should probably check out how these adventures work. If you are interested in how um, board games can weave narrative into uh, campaign gameplay in new interesting ways, you should check these out. You might be wondering, why is Dungeon Alliance Adventures at number 14? Why well, didn't it make my top 10? Another thing I learned, having played this now with Jen... Well, it's what I talked about earlier. Jen and I have a hard time with super long games. And Dungeons Alliance, honestly, at this point, when I covered it, when it was on Kickstarter, I had only played it as a four-player game and a solo game. I have now played it with Jen as a two-player game, and I'm pretty confident, I'm pretty comfortable saying that for our taste, uh, Dungeon Alliance is best as a solo game, where I've got my four characters, I've got my deck, I'm building it, I'm moving around, and I don't have to worry about any other players. There's a deck of cards that determines how the monsters will attack that I can manipulate and stuff like that. I, it works at higher player counts, but oh my gosh, it gets so long, because this is a crunchy, heavy, heavy, heavy game. Like I said, it is up there in the realm of Mage Knight. Uh, or Mage Knight Adventures from Vlado Shivada. And, you know, and I, I say that as high, high praise. Mage Knight is also too long for Jens and my taste. So, that's really our only issue because, you know, the, the gameplay is sharp. There's a lot of persnickety little rules. That's one thing you have to bear in mind, too. It can be overwhelming. There's so much that goes into this game, but it um, rewards devoted play. And with these new adventure modules, um, man, it's going to have legs for years, I think. And that's number 14. Dungeon Alliance, the new adventure expansions. Then we move on to number 13, Ishtar. This is the uh, one of the latest games. It actually came out last year from Bruno Cathala. He had a co-designer. I'm sorry, I do not remember your name. I should have written it down before I started. But anyway, um, this is a tile land game. And it's really clever. It is all about um, growing beautiful gardens in the desert, uh, springing up from these lovely little fountain miniatures. I mean, everything about the production of this game is super stellar. It's gorgeous. And it's a nice, sharp, fun, puzzly game too. Because the drafting of these tiles that come in different sizes and layouts uh, has to do with this kind of rondelle mechanism. So, okay, I can take this one or i got to spend resources resources to grab one of the later ones, but if I wait for you to move forward, I can grab the one I really want next turn, but what if you take it? That kind of stuff. And that works really well. The tile laying works really well. The spreading of the, you know, the, the harvesting of resources when we lay tiles, and then the spreading of gardens that get laid on top of the tiles. All of that stuff uh, is very nice. I actually liked it a lot. It's rating a little bit lower because my wife Jen had a hard time with it because if there's one interesting thing about the or one odd thing about this game is it really thumbs its nose at conventions. There are a series of specific rules that are kind of hard to get into your head that limit you in how you can lay your tiles. Uh, you know, there is a difference between tiles and gardens that are on tiles, and Jen really struggled with that. Don't get me wrong, she could get it. Um, given enough time if, if she were inclined to go back in. But she was kind of frustrated. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I could have done a better job teaching the core rules. But as it was, Jen didn't have as much fun. I thought it was really neat. Um, also, there's a whole other little mini game based on unlocking special powers. Really, a lot of good stuff. I, I highly recommend checking it out. But bear in mind, it is a bit tougher to learn. Um, not because it's heavy. It's, it's just a nice medium-weight tile lane game. But... 
so a few of the rules are really kind of unintuitive. They kind of fly in the face of traditional rules. I like that. I like it when a game just, you know, flies in the face of standards and tradition and does something completely different, and that's what Ishtar does. But it was maybe a little too outside of the box for Jen, which is why it's sitting at our number 13 of the month. Then we got number 12, the oh-so-adorable Quirky Circuits. And now, this is a cooperative game. It's another imperfect communication cooperation game. And I talked about one earlier, the uh, Fox and the Forest duet, where, you know, Jen and I really admired and respected that, but at the end, it just wasn't challenging enough for us because we play a lot of these kind of games. Quirky Circuits kind of turned out to be the same thing. Here's the situation. There are, um, we are working together to try to program an automated robot in our home, whether it's a Roomba style thing or a robot that, you know, cuts the grass or, you know, uh, you know, picks stuff. I think, yeah, there, I think there was a, uh, a, a, a fruit picking robot and stuff like that. There's all these automated robots and and the game comes with a book of different levels that we're trying to play through. Each level has its own objectives of what you're trying to do and we're just trying to make sure the robot gets these things done before its battery goes dead. And um, the thing is, we start with a handful of cards that can give the robot very simple orders like Robo Rally style orders, move forward, rotate left, turn 180 degrees, move forward, double, stuff like that. Very simple commands. And... As soon as the timer, um, uh, well, actually, no, there, there is no timer. As, as soon as we start playing, as soon as you say, okay, here's what the robot has to do. He has to go into these corners. He has to do this, that, and the other. Okay, we've got our hand of cards that we can give the robot orders. Go! And then, there's no actual timer, but cooperatively, either of us can start playing cards face down to program the robot. We cannot talk. Uh, we can't talk at all. I think that we can say one thing. We can, we're allowed to say beep bloop or something like that. So it's the only thing we're allowed to say. And so I might start playing cards face down because I've got cards that, okay, I can have him move forward uh, two spaces and then turn left and then move forward. That'll hit the first thing. But then, oh, I, I, then he's kind of stuck. And I don't. I, I, all I can make him do is turn in place. And that's not going to help. So I'll go ahead and play these cards. But I'm playing cards to the programming queue at the exact same time you are. And you don't know what I'm playing. And I don't know what you're playing. And sooner or later, both of us think, well, I guess we've played enough cards. Let's run the program, turn them all face up, and see what the robot does. So it's very, very tricky. We have one bit of information. When I play a card down, you, the only thing you know is, oh, that's a card that moves him forward or backwards. Or, oh, that's a card that allows him to turn in place. You have very rudimentary ideas. So you could, oh, well, look, I did a forward-backwards movement thing, and I did a rotate, and I didn't know the forward-backwards thing. And then I didn't play anything anymore. And then you could be thinking, well, that could be forward one and then rotate and then forward two to that thing. Oh, but it could be backwards one, rotate, and then back into that corner. And you can't be sure. And so we are not allowed to discuss what we're going to do. We just have to kind of intuit what we think uh, everybody's going to do. And this almost has kind of a mind-like quality, because if I can see I've got cards that are going to be perfect, I want to get them played as fast as I can before you play things that messes it up. And you might be in the same situation as me, and once they're played... Well, it's tricky. And once we both agree, yeah, let's see what happens, the robot might work like a real-life Roomba and just run back and forth in circles, slamming into walls because we did a bad job programming it. So, this is a sweet, charming little game. It works very well. But Jen and I found, again, we've done enough of these that... <laughs> It was, there were definitely challenges, but once we kind of got the groove, no matter how complex, because some of the other robots, like the little robot dog and whatnot, uh, they can get more complex, but still, we were able to work our way through it without too terribly much challenge, and I really think the game would have exceeded, would have excelled more with a bit more chaos, with a third or fourth player also throwing programming cards in. Because me and Jen are like, oh, you're not going to play anything? Well, okay, I guess I'll do this. Again, it had kind of a mind feel, and we were able to run the game pretty successfully, and it didn't really push us as hard as we would have liked. Loved it, though. I think it would be great as a gateway game. A wonderful gateway game, because so light, so simple and easy to teach. And also, I think, for gamers, for gamer geeks, it would be good at higher player counts. There's a two-player amongst two gamer geeks that I think at this point we're pretty good at imperfect communication co-ops. It was just a little bit too lightweight for us. And so that's why it's number 12, Quirky Circuits. Then we've got number 11, Time Stories Experience. Now this is the beginning of the season two, Time Stories Revolution, that um, promises to completely revamp the entirety of how the Time Stories 
puzzle, narrative, adventure, time travel games work, and does it ever. Here's the deal. I'm going to have to um, say number 11 on my list is Time Stories Experience. Number 10 on my list is Time Stories Hadel Project, which is the first episode of Season 2 of Time Stories. These two things really... Well, Time Stories Experience is an expansion for Time Stories Hadel Project. So it's kind of hard for me to talk about experience without first talking about my number 10. So we're going to do things a little out of order. Number 10. Time Stories Hadel Project is a uh, story about, um, you know, like all time stories where time travelers going back to fix the past uh, because something has gone wrong. And, uh, you know, in, in, you know uh, kind of occupying the bodies of people who lived in those previous time zones. Here, we're going back into the year 2099, actually. So, it's, we're going back to the future. And uh, we're in a deep-sea underwater research lab. And there's something. The danger is afoot. Th strange things are going on, and we got to solve the mystery. As is always the case. Here's the deal. It, uh, Hadel Project was a very good Time Stories story. Uh, you know, the time travel, the science fiction, the characters, all that stuff is very nice. Um, but the more important thing is, Hadel Project is the beginning of the second series of time stories. Radically changes a lot of rules. Most of them, they are changed for the better. Dice have been eliminated from time stories and replaced with a kind of... Uh, Push your luck style, almost, or not push your luck, but a a card combat system not too dissimilar from Gloomhaven, uh, which is all but not push your luck, but about probability management and keeping track of what has been played, what's been, what's still in the card, what do we have to do to be able to ensure we succeed at this test we're doing. Liked it a lot. Such a huge improvement over the uh, dice. But the sad thing is, this Hadel project didn't really push the idea as far as it could. There's a lot of things that can be done. I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised by it, but more than anything else, I'm excited to see what they will do in future chapters of Time Stories. That response is pretty much how I feel about all of Hadel Project. All of the changes, I think, for the most, with one exception, were good, were cool, but the Hadel Project was kind of introducing these ideas, so it didn't push them very far. Compared to previous time stories uh, from the first season that really pushed the envelope and did all kinds of crazy outside of the outside of the box stuff, Hadel Project plays it safe, and that's really my main complaint. I like the story. I like all the new ideas for the core mechanisms. I would have liked the developers to do something a little bit more daring with the mechanisms. Right now, it the Hadel Project almost as an entirety felt kind of like a tutorial for time stories, but it was a full mission. Now, I should say, though, there is one thing I'm very disappointed by, Although a lot of people will love it. Time Stories no longer has you do the Groundhog Day. Oh, we jump into the past, we try and figure out some stuff, we run afoul of something, and we die, or we run out of time, and then we have to reset and go again. And then we can montage our way through what we've done before and just get back to where we were. Jen and I love that. I've talked about this at great length. That has been cut. You will either be sad, like me and Jen, or you'll be happy, like a lot of other Time Story players. That's really my main complaint. That's the thing that keeps it from being higher. Um, but more than anything else, I'm excited about Time Stories moving forward because Hadel Project shows so much promise, even if it doesn't quite live up to the promise that it shows. So with that out of the way, now I'll go back to number 11, Time Stories Experience. Because here's the other big thing that's changed about Time Stories. Um, each Time Stories uh, adventure is now a standalone that has no reference to the overarching story of what's happening with our time agency in the future, and you know, and all the machinations of the of the enemies of our agency and the characters that we have dealings with in the future. All that stuff, which used to be kind of wound into adventures, and so you'd see weird anachronisms pop up. Oh, we're in ancient Egypt, and what's this future future technology doing here? All that stuff is now gone, and. And um, so, each little adventure is a totally standalone. It's like Time Stories has gone from serialized storytelling to episodic storytelling. Which is fine, it's kind of a bummer, but they still have serialized storytelling with experience. Because now, if you buy the experience box, which is an expansion for all, for the next nine uh, standalone modules, they give you little prologues and epilogues that you play. You play experience before and after you play the adventure. And experience allows you to level your characters up, so you get more and more cool special abilities and weaknesses. You get to learn more about the world in the future and what's going on behind the scenes. So if you want the whole Time Stories experience, you've got to... You, you play an individual adventure, then once you're done with that, you scored a certain number of points, and you bring those points into experience, and you spend them resolving problems, uh, because there's all kinds of events and dangers in the future, and you also spend those points to level your characters up or get rid of weaknesses that you accrue. The two things together work quite nicely. 
I rated Experience lower than Hadel um, because I've only seen one tiny chapter of it. So it's kind of hard for me to say how is it going to evolve. I'm uh, like Hadel. I'm excited. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I haven't seen enough. So I'm rating it at 11. I'm reading Hadel at 10, and that's my number 11 and number 10. But I w talked about them at great length in the in the uh, rundowns I did for them this month if you want to go learn more. But anyway, that was number 11 and then number 10, Time Stories, Experience in Hadel Project. Number 9 is my first paid preview of the month. So remember, uh, I was paid to cover the game, so you should take my subjective means with a grain of salt. Rocket Men, which is still on Kickstarter right now at this very moment, is... As far as we're concerned, a very cool, very solid deck builder from Martin Wallace. Yes, that Martin Wallace. And uh, Martin Wallace is a great, great designer. This game is all about the modern day space race, not the one from the 50s and 60s. Hooray, finally. I've had enough 50s and 60s uh, US versus USSR uh, stuff for a while, thanks. So it was nice to have modern day settings and modern day technologies that we were discovering as we deck build, deck build, deck build to try and launch projects to uh, Earth orbit or to the moon or to Mars. The interesting thing is, this is a deck builder where you're buying new stuff, you know, using cards to generate goods, to buy new things, and oh dear, someone's calling. Uh, you know what? Hold on, folks. Oh, wait, nope. Alrighty, the spam machine caught it. Hooray. This is the best um, $2 a month I spend on that spam catcher. Phew. All right. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Nomo Robo, I believe, is its uh, service if you're interested at all and you don't want any more spam calls on your mobile. Anyway, though, sorry. Rocket Man. That's what I was talking about. So, uh, it's an interesting deck builder in that you spend a good deal of time just buying more cards, putting them in your deck so your space agent becomes more powerful. But you also spend a good deal of time taking those cards out of your deck to put them on your launch pad so that you can have more and more resources devoted to your next project that's going to score you a lot of points, whether it's going to the moon or whatever. And so, your deck kind of go waxes and wanes. It gets big and fat, but then you start pulling all the stuff out to make it a project, and then, while you're before you launch that project, your deck gets very thin, and you can get to stuff really quick. And so, are you going to do the project, or are you going to try and stay thin for a while? But you know what? You're racing to complete these projects. If I don't get there first, I'm not going to lose out on bonuses. And as soon as I complete that project, all those cards I pulled out of my deck, they flood back into my deck again, and my deck gets thick and fat, and then i got to start pulling it all out again. This is very cool. This is very different, and it really is a fresh feel, and I like it quite a bit. Also thrown in here is a very cool idea that when I decide to do uh, launch a uh, you know a, a manned mission to Mars or whatever, there's no guarantee I'm going to succeed. Uh, the more time I spend preparing, the more likely I am. But there is a deck of cards that you have to draw. They're success cards. You only get to draw a certain number of them, and the sum total of all the cards you draw has to be greater than or equal to a target. And so you could bust, and if you bust you lose everything. You might have spent half the game preparing for this mission. If the mission fails, you lose a lot. Which is why, as you're drawing cards and trying to add up to get the success, you can abort the mission anytime you want. And if you abort early, you won't lose very many cards. So, the push your luck thing is actually cool and fresh. The deck building is very interesting. The setting is lovely. My only complaint with the game, the reason it's number nine is... Two-player scaling again. Um, a big part of what should be creating tension for the game is, I want to be the first with a, uh, uh, a moon base. Or I want to be the first with the manned mission to Mars. Because there's a big bonus if I'm the first one there. And if I were playing this game with more players, chances are... We, you, uh, me and somebody else at the table are probably both going to be racing to try and get that um, breakthrough. And so I am incentivized to push my luck a little bit more to launch the project and maybe run the risk. In a two-player only game, Jen and I found, oh yeah, you know what, I'm doing this moon stuff. Oh, you're doing Mars stuff. Yeah, there's no tension. There's no race. We'll just both kind of do our stuff. And ah, I really would, I wished... There had been some tightening done again. So, you know, those bonuses are not first for, um, you know, the, the first to do a specific type of mission on the Mars, but the first to do a mission at all, you know, let's say. And then suddenly, oh, I got a race to beat her! Even though we're doing radically different missions, there could have been a bit more done to tighten things up again, and that would have been very much appreciated. It's okay. It, we enjoyed it as a two-player game, but I suspect it would be more exciting and more dynamic and more tension-filled with more players. And so that's really my only complaint. That's what keeps Rocketman at number nine. Then we have number eight, or number eight 
Yes, Inner Compass. This is a game which is all about players trying to walk the road of life and um, come to terms with their emotional journey to seek enlightenment by discovering their true life values and goals. And that may sound very, very cool. Unfortunately, while that theme is present in the mechanisms, it is largely abstracted out. And this is really a game uh, about traveling around on a grid, matching uh, colors on a grid to colors on a collection of cards so that you can unlock bonus cards, so you can set collect more effectively, so you can complete um, objectives to score points. There is nothing wrong with that. And in fact, the gameplay here is very good uh, in kind of an abstract set collection, board traversal uh, kind of way. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I have two problems with the game, which is why it isn't higher. One, uh, um, the theme could have been presented more strongly and integrated into the world. Instead of moving around abstract blocks, we should have been moving around actual life event pictures so that we'd say, oh, when I move over to this space, I didn't just have a happy experience. I specifically got married so that the game feels like it tells more of a story of life. That is totally absent, and that's probably the biggest sin in this. It could have done so much more to create an interesting narrative the way that Pursuit of Happiness does. Or... Um, um, CV as an example. There's a few other games out there that do this kind of thing that really make uh, a, a, the game where it's all about living the best life possible. I love that and I was sad to see that that theme was largely abstracted out and it didn't need to be if the game had been presented a different way. My other problem, once again, two-player scaling. The board is huge. And when you uh, make permanent lifelong memories, that th sounds cool thematically, but all it means is you take one of your cubes and you put it on the board and you kind of own that space which means other players have to pay more resources to claim that space as well, which they might want to do for scoring or whatever. And that's cool. Again, it's unfortunately a little bit more abstracted than it should be. But um, the problem is, it's a big old board. And in a two-player game, I tend to claim my stuff over here, you claim your stuff over there, and we don't tend to bump into each other too much. The game so desperately, all like all the way back with World Without End, so many games this month, if they had just done the tiniest bit more work, just as part of setup, put a third player's cubes out on the boards in some kind of pattern so that the board gets tightened up and we have that type of tension that we would have at a higher player count. Those two things keep it out of the top five because, don't get me wrong, the gameplay here is really sharp and we enjoyed it quite a bit. We enjoyed it so much that even though it's a largely abstract game, we're going to keep it. We like it, but we would have liked to see a little bit more changes. That's why Inner Compass sits at number eight. Then... We have, how long have I been going here? Uh, what am I at now? I am at 56. Oh dear. No wonder I'm so thirsty. But hey, we're getting close. We're getting close. We have number seven. <laughs> Aftermath. Okay, so this is the latest from Jerry Hawthorne, designer, uh, who gave us Mice and Mystics, Stuffed Fables, Comanauts. Uh, and Jerry is known for being at the forefront of really wonderful, evocative world building and storytelling. All of his adventure games are all about having this big old narrative book that are full of pages. Each page represents a board that gives you all kinds of unique special case rules that are always very so thematically grounded, so rich, so evocative, and um, you're playing characters who are so very interesting. And that is certainly true in Aftermath, which is set in a post-apocalyptic modern world city where all humans disappeared one day and all animals got human levels of intelligence. And now, societies of animals have banded together in kind of a Mad, pa Mad Max uh, post-apocalypse scenario where everybody's fighting over ever-dwindling resources because all the humans have disappeared and nobody knows why. It's brilliant. I so want to see a movie made in this world. Uh, that's true for all of Jerry's games uh, because he's just a he's a master storyteller. But in all of his previous games, I have always praised his storytelling and his world building so much, and I've always thought his gameplay design was solid, but always way too lightweight for Jens and my taste. Very much, it was always a weird mix of really light decisions, but really complex sets of rules. So 
they've, they've always been kind of hit or miss with uh, Jedi. Mostly miss, even, Amer- even though we love the worlds that we were exploring. I'm happy to say Aftermath is the first game from Jerry where his gameplay is as solid as... Uh, for me, a gamer geek, as his narrative. And that is saying something because the world here is amazing. It's beautifully presented, wonderful miniatures, great gameplay. Uh, He's gotten rid of dice, mostly gotten rid of dice. And instead, it's all about hand management with multi-use cards that we can use for movement or fighting or talking to people or interacting with stuff, completing uh, communal goals, all sorts of things, and um, always facing the threat of either running out of time and having our colony back home starve or uh, or you know face all kinds of uh, trials and tribulations or actually getting attacked by... The most cute, adorable little anthropomorphized Pixar, Disney-esque creatures you've ever seen. And so, while I think the gameplay is great, and I think the world is great, there were a couple of issues. What now, phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not doing that. Not doing that. Not doing that. Alrighty. Should have left that in the other room like I normally do. Anyway, what was I saying? I'm talking about Aftermath. So, here's the issue with it. Um... Okay, that that phone thing is just only throwing me off. Hold on a second, folks. I'm thirsty. I'll be right back. Okie doke. So, uh, I feel much better now. Right, so, issues with Aftermath. Really only one, but it's a pretty significant one. I am so frustrated with the rules of this game. The rules are very spare. I was surprised when I first got it just how short the rulebook is. A game like this, I would have expected it to be at least another four pages long. So, it's very, very short. And... In large part, it's so short because the rules really try to get a lot of ideas across in as few words as possible, so you don't have to spend much time reading rules. And that proves to be a recipe for frustration. Very, very often, I have found. Uh, We have not played a session where there hasn't been at least one time where we're like, oh, how, what? I don't know, and there's nothing in here. I've looked through the whole rulebook three times. I got nothing. I don't know. Let's go post on BoardGameGeek and you can find out. And that's so frustrating. In fact, the developers have already started making a multi-page FAQ because so many questions have popped up. And so, I wish I had started with that FAQ because it would have helped a lot. Although, even still, um, you know, I've played this game several times now. I've filmed two separate run-throughs, and I'm still discovering things that I'm playing wrong because the rules are really vague. Um, so, if you watch my run-through, please watch with the Klingon subtitles turned on, and hopefully that will help you avoid it, mistakes that we have made. Um, and that's a real shame. A real shame. I have never seen a rule book so crying out for actual concrete examples. It just says, oh, well, it very cursorily and very briefly says, oh, well, you just do this, this, and this. And this is like that thing. And boom, that's all you need to know. Boop, boop, boop. No, it's not all I need to know. If that's all you're going to say, you better give me a half a page walking me through a very detailed explanation of how all that stuff works. If you want to be confident that I have intuited what you meant to say, rules writer... Sorry to whoever out there wrote the rules. They're really wonderfully presented, but yeah, they... I And I know I'm not alone. A lot of people are complaining about the rules, and it's a real shame. Now, I don't say this to scare you away, because the experience of this game is so wonderful. Just make sure you get that FAQ, and uh, make sure you you have a Board Game Geek account, so if you do get stuck, you can quickly get an answer. Because to Jerry's credit, he is Johnny on the spot, answering questions as soon as they get asked. And they get asked a lot. So... That's a real shame, and that's a real black eye on an otherwise stellar... This could have been Game of the Month for me. Easily. But the rulebook brings it crashing all the way down to... What is it? Number seven. Aftermath. Before I go on, though, one more thing I'll mention. You would not be wrong to assume that this would be a great game to play with families, because it's so cute and um, adorable, and Jerry's previ- most of Jerry's previous games were definitely aimed at family-friendly... Uh, gameplay scenarios, stuff fables, and mice and mystics. This game, the gameplay, you can definitely play with kids. It's family friendly. It's a little bit more going on, but not too much. Here's the problem. I mentioned this is Mad Max in a Pixar uh, cute animal world. That's what it is. And when I say Mad Max, I mean sometimes it gets dark and grim. Watch my final thoughts. I actually read an excerpt from one of the passages you're supposed to read to your kids, and that could give your kids nightmares. Uh, At least I suspect it could. I don't know. It's a concern I have, and if you're thinking about getting this to play with your kids, you should look into that a little bit, uh, because you would have to make a decision of what can your kids handle. Because if Aftermath were a movie, it would be 
a PG-13 movie, I think. At the very least, PG. It would definitely not be G-rated. It would be PG, but I think it would be PG-13. And um, so that's something I don't think anybody would expect from Jerry's previous works. And so that's something to bear in mind, too, with my number seven of the month, Aftermath. Then we have number six, Micro City. This was another paid preview I did for a game that's on Kickstarter, and I believe it is still on Kickstarter right now. And it has been very successful because, I gotta say, folks, this is a fantastic little um, Sim City city building game. Really sharp. It's a micro game. It you know collapses down to almost nothing. Just a few cubes, a few cards, and a few dice. But it is so rich with gameplay potential. Every time you play, you get different objectives you're trying to chase after. And there is a very smart mix. I'm thinking about now, but kind of has overlap a little bit with Inner Compass's mix of moving around, moving your avatar on a board uh, so that you can get access to different things that you need to complete objectives. Uh, here you're moving around on your on your little, what is it? It's a it's an 8x8, or is it a 4x1, 2, 3, 4? I forget. You can look at my run through. I think it was a 4x4 grid, or no, it was an 8x8 grid. Ugh, I'd have to go look myself, because I, I filmed this uh, weeks ago now. But moving your little guy around and the different places you can go to can give you access to different things. And uh, yeah, it's just super sharp. It's a lot of fun. I've mostly played it solo, and it sings. It was originally designed as a solo game, but interestingly, it has very good co-op rules, which is kind of... Those are those are kind of the owner room style. Oh, this is clearly a solo game, but yeah, you can split the... the uh, the uh, tasks between a couple of players if you want to play co-op. The co-op was was good. The solo is great. And the competitive is great. I, I think... I, I'm, I was really surprised. They asked me, hey, when you cover this, just co show the solo. I think I should have shown how the competitive works because it's really sharp and it adds a lot of extra layers to the game. And Jen and I really liked it quite a bit. I, I, you know, and I should say I liked it at all player counts. But it really exceeds as a competitive game or a solo game. The co-op is good too. And uh, like I said, it's on Kickstarter, I think, for a little bit longer. And you'll learn more about it here. But I'm just saying... My question is, last month in December, I did a top 10 SimCity style games. If I'd had Micro City at the time, would it have made my top 10? Yes, I believe it would have. It, def it would have kicked out City Council out of my number 10 slot. Yes, it's that good. But like I said, I, I was paid to preview the game, so you should take my personal subjective opinion with a grain of salt. Or even better, watch the video and decide for yourself if it looks like fun. That's what I always suggest. Don't listen to me. I'm just some schlub with a camera. But anyway, that was my number six, Micro City. Then on to number five, Solar Draft. Wow, this one really surprised us. I thought this was going to be a lightweight little drafting card game truffle of a... Or trifle. Or truffle. Either way, um, of, a, of a game where uh, we are solar architects trying to make our, the, the highest scoring solar system we can. There's a bunch of planets and comets. Every turn, I'm either going to grab a comet, draft it from the common, or I'm going to play one to my solar system. The cards, the, you know, the planets and, and uh, comets and moons all have special powers, and you're trying to get them all to line up to score you the most points. Seemed like it was going to be really simple, and I was blown away by how good this is. This might be Jen's game of the month, quite frankly. She really loved it a lot. She wanted to play it again immediately after we were done. And we played it several times, and, well, one, I gotta say, you know, over the last few months, I think there have been a few times I've been talking about games that have really wonderful, core, fresh, innovative gameplay mechanisms, like Steamopolis is one. And there have been a few others besides... But you don't get to do anything interesting with these really fresh, innovative mechanisms because the actual actions that your engines build towards are fairly mundane. This is a game that is not fresh or innovative at all. It's a very simple drafting thing, but there is so much variety in the cards you get. So many cool things you can do that when you get this card, like, oh, I have to make, I have to do everything to make this card reach its full potential. But that means these other cards are useless now. I toss you aside. Uh, you know, you don't. You still can use them for other things. And I, I, we were really blown away by this. By the gameplay of this game is so sharp because of all the variety from all the card effects. And you know, the the clever trying to build up your solar system, getting the right planets into the right slots, and all that. That aside, though, there's something that really elevates the game even more. Unlike most astro uh, astronomy-themed games, and I've covered a few recently. There's going to be one coming next month as well. This game doesn't play it straight. It isn't just full of really pretty pictures of planets. It's Everything is cute and cartoony and charming and joyful and just so happy. 
And it really made me stop to reflect just how much our brains are hardwired to respond to happy faces. And we were constantly in this game playing with cute, adorable little faces. Because, hey, a planet is just a circle. Why make it look like a real planet when you can make it look like a cute little adorable face? A cartoon face. Ah, we loved it. Uh, that really, I mean, some people might be turned off by it, but for us, it so elevated the experience. We were over the moon. Which is a silly uh, phrase, a turn or turn of phrase for this, but Solar Draft is phenomenal. Really surprising, just how good is my number five of the month, Solar Draft. And then, <clears throat> oh excuse me, hold on. Oh, I'm really getting stuffed up. I hope I'm not getting sick. I just got just snot for days rolling down the back of my throat. Anyway, though, that's not what you're here for, right? You're not here for the snot report. You're here for the game report. Let's talk about my number four. Suburbia Collector's Edition. Now, Suburbia, for the longest time, and actually, I was going to uh, scratch that. Suburbia is widely regarded by many people as the greatest modern SimCity-inspired board game there is. And I have no problem with people making that uh, proclamation, because Suburbia is phenomenal. It is a great game. It is all about drafting tiles that represent different features that you could add to your suburbs. Everybody has their own suburb. Slotting them together in a really fun, intricate clockwork tile laying puzzle. And uh, yeah, and you know, maintaining your economy, uh, your income versus your population. Super sharp game. One of the best. Suburbia has been in my top 100 games for years, and it's not going anywhere. So recently, I believe it got its 10th anniversary Super Mega co Deluxe Collector's Edition, and wow, 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 wow. This is such a step up in terms of production over the original Suburbia. It broke my heart, but I got rid of my original Suburbia, signed by Ted Allspock, the designer himself. Signed by Ted, I got rid of that to make room on my shelf for the, the Deluxe Edition. Because, well, the whole game has gotten a graphical makeover. It is so much more better presented now. The suburb you're building really comes to life in a much more meaningful way. It's less abstract and blueprinty and more... Well, no, the, I can actually see the thing I'm building, and that's lovely. And, uh, while I personally am not the biggest fan of ginormous boxes, because, hey, I was able to fit all the expansions for Suburbia in the original Little Suburbia box, I do have to say, all the trays that everything is broken up into makes playing Suburbia so much more pleasant now. Because I've talked about this in the past with some of the expansions when I covered them. One of the problems with Suburbia is as you get more and more expansions, it gets more and more of a pain to set the game up. Because if you're going to bring in stuff from an expansion, you have to take out an equal number of stuff from the base game to keep everything balanced. And that's just kind of a bummer to have to do. But the um, organizational way that this collector's edition is put together makes that a much less onerous task. And that has a direct impact on the overall gameplay quality. But putting the storage system aside, the presentation of this new uh, is is through the roof. It's got to have one of the greatest presentations of any modern Euro, and with good reason, because Suburbia deserves it. It makes a lot of people's top 10 of all time, with good reason. Um, the, you know, because this is a tile drafting game, and the old game, oh, I bought one, and then that goes out. All the other ones have to be slid over, and a new one comes out. Now, all the tiles are kept kind of on this uh, carousel that makes that less onerous and burdensome. It just keeps, you know, and it's just fun to buy something and slide everything over. And your upcoming tiles are not just kept in a bunch of individual stacks, they're kept in a gigantic tower. It kind of almost feels like a Vegas style thing that the cards come out of. I, I, it's really super impressive. And I mean, uh, and, and the art is great. I think, I didn't check, I think all the tiles are a little bit bigger than they used to be. So you have a, a better overall presentation. The scoreboard is much easier to read than it used to be. Everything about the quality of play is improved, even though they didn't change the rules at all. They just improved the uh, components, not only for looks, but also to enhance gameplay. And I gotta say, hats off to them. They did an amazing job. And if all that weren't enough, uh, right now I'm just talking about the collector's edition you can go out and buy. But there were some additional Kickstarter exclusive things that make the game even easier to play. And if you're interested in those, they are for sale now. In addition, if you get the collector's edition, there's some things you don't get. But you can find out more about that on Bezier's uh, webpage because you can buy those things separately. And I want to get those too. Uh, like little miniatures that makes it easier to at a glance scan to see if there's any... 
um, restaurants out there or, or um, you know, or uh, airports or whatever. Because a lot, a big part of suburbia is, hey, as I'm building up my suburb, I have to pay attention to what's in your suburb because what I put in mine might affect you and vice versa. So, I, long story short, this is the way you do a collector's edition. It's amazing presentation, amazing packaging, and if all that weren't enough, uh, also some new content as well. There's a new mini expansion that comes called uh, Suburbia Nightlife. It's, I forget what it is, is it like a couple dozen new tiles and the um, that are all nighttime based? Some of them just, oh, things that happen at night, like a pawn shop, or you, you tend to think of more, you know, after hours type things, and uh, also scary stuff, like there's uh, some supernatural werewolfy type stuff and whatnot too. Uh, which, of course, is appropriate because it's from Bezier Games, the werewolf people. But, um, you know, Suburbia has always had a sense of humor like that, and it continues to. So the, uh, the Nightlife expansion is nice. The thing I like most about it is it really integrates with all the other expansions really, really well. That has not always been the case. Like I was saying earlier, it's kind of a pain to have to pull stuff out to put stuff in. But it feels like these Nightlife tiles will just pretty much always work, however they get mixed in, and you'll never feel like, oh, this doesn't work if this other thing isn't in the game. So I think it is reflective of the fact that they've gotten really good at designing content for Suburbia. And as far as I know, the only way to get this new uh, Nightlife or is it nighttime? I think it's nightlife expansion is as part of this super collector's edition. And like I said, folks, I mean, it was heartbreaking to get rid of my original one, my first printing edition signed by Ted himself, but the overall experience is so improved, uh, you know, I, I had to do it. So that's why my number four is Suburbia, the collector's edition. Then we move on to number three, Circle the Wagons. And here's the deal. This game actually came out in a kind of limited way, almost a print and play. No, it's a bit more in print and play, but in a really limited way back in 2017. Uh, Quinn Games published it this year in 2019 with a, a nicer production with a box instead of coming in an envelope like the original one did. And so I'd never seen Circle Your Wags before, but they sent me this new updated version of it where the game hasn't changed at all. It just comes in a box now, mainly, instead of an envelope. And here's the deal, folks. I retroactively have to add Circle the Wagons into my top 10 games of 2017 because it is so good. It is my number three of the month and it is amazing. It is a micro game where um, there are, well, I think the game comes with either 16 or 18 cards. On the back of all the cards are whatever it is, 16 or 18 unique objectives. Every time you play, you take three cards at random. Those are the objectives everybody's trying to, to chase after. And then the rest of the cards are circled around those objectives, hence the circling of the wagons. And on your turn, you can take a card, the next one that's available to take, um, but if you don't want that, and you want the card that's three spaces all along in the circle, kind of Rondell style, yeah, you can go ahead and jump forward and take that, but the ones you skip, you'll be giving to your opponent. And that's a tough choice, because if I don't jump forward and get that one, that's the most important card in this game. But look, I'm giving you three cards to take that one card. And then, once you, however you get the cards, whatever it is, you then have to put them, slot them together in a wonderful t uh, card stacking puzzle, which is maybe the best one of these I've ever seen. And that's, you know, Honshu and Hanging Gardens and all the rest of it. Circle the Wagons is amazing. This is it jumped from nowhere into my top 30 games of all time. I am so blown away by it. Uh, it has so much game in such a tight little package. It is the ultimate micro game. And uh, I wish I could have given it its proper due back in 2017 when it came out. But I'm glad to play it now. I'm glad to own it. Circle the Wagons, my number three of the month. Then we move on to, uh, was it number two, Aeon's End Outcasts. All right, this is my third and last paid preview, although this is not up yet. This, I think, goes live next week on Kickstarter. But again, I was paid to preview it. You'll see my preview when it goes live. Uh, grain of salt and all that, but here's the deal. It doesn't matter what I say. Folks, this is new Aeon's End content. Case closed. Aeon's End is by far one of the best cooperative... It, cooperative games on the market. One of the best cooperative card games. Card games. Just one of the best co-op fantasy games of all time. We love it to bits. And it just keeps getting better. And um, this is a new expansion slash standalone. So you don't have to own previous Aeons in. You could just jump right in with Outcast and skip New Age and Legacy and War Eternal and the original and, and the, the dozen or so different little expansions that come in between if you want to. Um, but... I mean, you already know if you love Aeon's End or not, right? So let me talk to all the people who don't know Aeon's End. This is a cooperative uh, fantasy deck builder. 
follows kind of the Dominion approach where there are a fixed number of cards that are randomly selected every time you play that you're building your deck with, but everybody's working cooperatively to take down a nemesis. And every time you play, you're going to play against another big boss. Every nemesis this game has ever had has cool, interesting, unique rules that makes playing it like a whole new different game because you have what you have to do to be able to beat these nemesis and all their minions. And of course, every time you play, you get a different combination of cards to build up. And uh, it's a the most interesting thing about the deck building is you never shuffle your deck. Once you've played all the cards in your deck and you've got your discard pile, you take that, you flip it over, that is your draw pile. So, um, po uh, you know, card deck management is such a big deal because the order that you discard your cards in affects the order you will play your cards in the next time you go through that deck. And that one thing is so brilliant and puts this so head and shoulders above most deck builders. Mo it's just absolutely amazing. So, Aeon's End is amazing. Why is Outcast amazing? Uh, well, there's a couple things. It has a one really cool new feature. And I don't want to go into story spoilers because it has actually a very good story. Uh, the best story by far. One of the best fantasy narrative adventures I've played in any modern board game, quite frankly. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I don't want to spoil any of that. But the central new feature is the fact that Gravehold, which is the city that we protect in Aeon's End, Gravehold has always just been a virtual punching bag. It's a bunch of victory or uh, uh, life points. If Gravehold takes too much damage, we lose. That's all Gravehold has ever been. And you can heal Gravehold and you gotta protect it. Now, Gravehold fights back. Instead of earning charges for your own character, you can spend your charges on Gravehold, and Gravehold has a deck of cards that are super powerful moves. And so not only do you want to keep Gravehold alive because you lose, but you want to keep Gravehold fed. Uh, so all your spare mana, or ether it's called, you could be throwing over there so it can do big cool moves, but Gravehold is unpredictable. You don't know what it's going to do. And in a game that is all about predictability, controlling your deck and whatnot, having that wild card on your side is really cool. Amazing. The storytelling is great. Uh, this is uh, this continues the what do you call it? The expedition system that was introduced last year in New Age and then expanded upon in Into the Wild. In fact, actually, for Die Hard Aeon's End fans, End of the Into the Wild ended with a cliffhanger, and this game picks up right after the cliffhanger of the last expansion. So that's cool stuff too. I love that with every new thing, the world gets deeper and richer. But more important than anything else, the gameplay just keeps getting better. With my number two, Aeon's End Outcast. But finally, folks, my number one game of the month. And as you can see, it was a good month. Uh, is the Network's Executives. Now this is an expansion that came out for the Networks, which is a game I covered years ago. And I've had executives for a while, and I've really wanted to play it. And the reason I finally got around is because the Networks, uh, which is a, uh, a wonderful card engine building game, about running your own TV network, trying to put the right stars and the right ads on the right shows in the right time slots to score lots of points. That's what Networks has always been. It's always been fantastic. Right now on Kickstarter is the Networks Duel, which is a special alternate version of the Networks that's for two players only. I haven't played it. I'm looking forward to trying it. But since that was coming out, I'm like, man, I should finally get Networks executives to the table because I've had it forever. I've wanted to play it. And here's the thing, folks. I'm kicking myself for waiting this long because the Networks, for the longest time has been in my top 60 out of my top 100 games. It's been right around 54, 55-ish for years, ever since I played it. I mean, and that's amazing. But here's the thing. Executives is such an amazing expansion. It immediately pushed uh, Networks into my top 25 games of all time. Because while it adds a bunch of stuff, the most important thing is it adds... Um, custom networks, so we no longer all start out the same. We start out with very unique special powers. If I am Netflix, I am a very di I'm playing a very different game than you are if you're PBS, or if you are ESPN, or you know, or again, not the real networks, but you know, they use kind of joking references to real life things, and um, it adds so much flexibility. And you want to play with every one of these different things, because they all are so different. If you are backed by a big Ted Turner type mogul, and um, you're trying to focus on, you know, so unique pl starting player powers really elevates this game in such a big bagged way. But then on top of that, I mentioned Ted uh, Turner, there are mogul cards. This is another thing you can be chasing after uh, if you reach certain uh, thresholds, uh, certain milestones. And when you get these, these are super mega powers that will come into your life halfway through the game. So you start with a big super mega power that makes you super special, but also all these uh, special starting powers come with big weaknesses as well that you have to work around. And then at some point in the game, 
after you've put on enough of the same type of show, um, you know, the bonuses you get are accentuated by the fact now you can get these moguls that give you this huge burst of power midway or maybe late in the game as well. Those two things so elevate networks, which was already a phenomenal game. Well, like I said, it's in my top 25 games of all time now. It is my number one game of the month. I was not paid to talk about this at all. Uh, Gil Hova, the publisher, uh, didn't contact me about... Uh, like I said, it was just because I knew it was coming out. I wanted to play I wanted to play Executives Forever, and I'm so glad I did because the Networks is so amazing now. I, you know, one of the best card games of all time, as far as I'm concerned. And my Game of the Month. And there you go, folks. That is it. We are done with the Roundup. Phew! And what is that? That's... Oh, it's only an hour and a half. Eesh, I gotta pick up the pace. Uh, but in the future... Uh, no. I got myself mixed up there. Obviously, I'm exhausted. So I'm just gonna say... Um, I'm just gonna walk quietly off... Stay, uh, exit stage right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.